Waking up in a meadow, a boy named Wataru Toyumi found himself being pursued by a horned rabbit. In his confusion and fear, he ran for his life, shouting back at the aggressive creature, wondering why he was being chased. Wataru, a 20-year-old anime and manga enthusiast, was just an average college student. As he fled from the fierce rabbit, he recalled the previous day's events. He had enjoyed an all-you-can-eat-and-drink at an izakaya with friends, singing karaoke until dawn. On his way home, inebriated, he fell off a bridge into the ocean. After escaping the rabbit, he paused to catch his breath and continued his recollection. He remembered waking up on the meadow after falling into the ocean, leading him to wonder if he was in a fantasy world. He laughed at the thought, noting that horned rabbits often appear in light novels. He jokingly said, status, expecting a screen to pop up, and to his surprise one did, displaying his stats. Shocked, he questioned the reality of the screen before him. A message notification appeared, confirming that the screen was indeed a status screen. The message introduced itself as a pleasure to meet Wataru and informed him that he had fallen between worlds and unfortunately could not return to his own. The message also granted Wataru two unique skills, language understanding and ship summoning, to help him cope with his new situation. Language understanding would allow him to read and write all languages, and ship summoning was given because he came from the sea and it seemed to fit his name. The message ended with a farewell and a wish for him to enjoy this new world. Processing all this new information, Wataru laid back on the grass, questioning the reality of his situation and whether he could ever return home. After some time, he cheered himself up, excited about his new skills. He decided to try out his ship summoning skill. He opened his status, clicked on his unique skills, and the information on ship summoning loaded up. It explained that he could summon purchased ships, which could be easily maneuvered and kept in optimal condition, but only from the shop menu. Understanding that his first ship could only be a rowboat, he told himself that he knew how to summon it. Toyumi stretched out his hand, calling forth a ship. As a boat materialized, he leaped up in amazement. Upon inspection, he found it to be an ordinary boat, just as he had expected. It was even on grass, which he found peculiar. As he pondered these oddities, a horned rabbit charged at him. By this time, he was already aboard the boat. As the rabbit prepared to strike with its small arm, Toyumi covered his head and closed his eyes, bracing for impact. After a few seconds of silence, he cautiously lowered his hands and opened his eyes. The charging rabbit was nowhere in sight. He wondered if it had disappeared. After a more thorough look around, he spotted the rabbit lying unconscious on the ground. He wasn't sure how it happened, but he was convinced that the ship's special ability had saved him. Looking up at the cloudy sky, he decided he needed to find a village to spend the night. He commanded the ship to return, and it vanished. He glanced at the fallen horned rabbit, unsure if he could eat it. He decided to take it with him and use the horn to drain its blood. As he left the forest, he reflected on the rabbit's violent nature and wondered what other dangerous creatures this world might hold. Upon exiting the forest, he was pursued by a goblin. He ran until he reached the outskirts of a city. Seeing the city filled him with relief. At the city gate, he noticed soldiers checking IDs. Knowing he couldn't reveal his otherworldly origins, he approached them cautiously. He explained that he had been attacked by a monster and had lost his luggage. He asked how he could gain entry. The soldiers looked at him strangely, then explained that he could receive a provisional ID to stay in the city for three days. First, however, he would need to touch the appraisal crystal to ensure he wasn't a criminal. After the crystal confirmed Toyumi's innocence, the guards welcomed him to the western city and allowed him to pass. Inside the city, Toyumi was amazed by the diversity of its inhabitants. He knew he needed to register with a guild before his provisional ID expired in three days. Spotting a building with a sword and shield flag, he wondered if it was the guild. Inside, he saw a beautiful, smiling lady and a grumpy old man with a scar on his face at separate desks. Despite preferring the lady's desk, he was too tired to wait in her line, so he approached the old man's desk, which had no cue. Toyumi approached the old man at the counter, inquiring about registering as an adventurer. The old man confirmed it was possible, but the registration fee was one silver coin. Toyumi, taken aback, admitted he had no money. He proposed paying the fee with a horned rabbit, but the old man said it wasn't enough. However, he could request a loan of one silver coin for registration, repayable within a month. Unaware of a silver coin's value, Toyumi asked how he could earn one. The old man explained that the guild bought horned rabbits for at least five copper each. If Toyumi brought in 20 rabbits, it would amount to one silver coin. The thought of facing 20 horned rabbits was daunting, 
but the fear of being expelled from the city after his provisional ID expired spurred him on. The old man then asked Toyumi to place his hand over a crystal to rank him as an adventurer. He was given an F-ranked adventurer's card. Toyumi asked if adventurers were classified by rank, and the old man confirmed, explaining the ranking system from SS to F Toyumi understood, and asked if he could hide anything on his ID card. After some thought, he decided to hide his last name and unique skills. The old man handed Toyumi a guidebook about the guild. As he was leaving, a guild attendant told him about a cheap place to stay for 10 copper a night. Toyumi sold the horned rabbits for 7 copper each at the guild and rented the room, which was large, unfurnished, and crowded. He chose a corner and slept there for the night. The next morning, after breakfast, Toyumi went to a quiet place to practice his ship summoning skill. As he pondered how the horned rabbit was defeated the previous day, a group of adventurers ran past, pursued by a horde of horned rabbits. Toyumi, sitting in his summoned boat, thought he was done for, but to his surprise, none of the rabbits could board the boat. He realized they were being deflected. Checking his status, he found that the summoned ship had two properties, unsinkable and indestructible. It also had a denial to board property, meaning nothing could board unless he, the captain, gave permission. This meant there was a barrier keeping everything and everyone out of the ship. Upon realizing his unique skill, Wataru was filled with joy. He found himself surrounded by a horde of horned rabbits. With a swift motion, he used the bow of his summoned ship to strike them from within the shop, successfully hunting a large number of rabbits. After the hunt, he returned to the guild and sold ten rabbits for seven copper each. That night, he lodged in the same spacious room as before. The next morning, Toyumi was on his way out when he encountered his landlady. She greeted him warmly, wishing him a good morning and inquiring whether he was off to hunt horned rabbits again, while advising him to take care. Toyumi responded with a good morning and confirmed that he was indeed going to hunt horned rabbits. Toyumi Wataru, once an ordinary college student, found himself in a different world after a fall into the ocean. Today marked his fifth day in this new realm. In the woods, he slew numerous horned rabbits, feeling thankful for the person who had bestowed upon him these extraordinary skills. With thoughts of purchasing a comfortable rubber raft ship occupying his mind, he returned to town, yet he was mindful of the debt he owed to the adventurer. At the exchange shop, he traded all the horned rabbits he had slain, totaling 25, which the merchant purchased for eight copper coins each. The sum of two silver coins for the rabbits filled him with joy. For a moment, he was tempted to buy the comfortable rubber raft, especially since he had an additional 90 coppers from before. However, snapping out of it, he remembered his obligation to repay his debt. He proceeded to the guild where a beautiful beast lady greeted him. Toyumi expressed his desire to repay the silver coin he had borrowed from the guild. The lady requested his adventurer guild card, which Toyumi provided along with a silver coin. After a brief moment, she informed him that his debt had been cleared from his card. Toyumi was astonished that such information could be recorded on the card without his knowledge. The lady confirmed this, took the card and the silver coin, and then asked him about his registration encounter. Toyumi recalled meeting an old man. The lady then elucidated the guild's operations, explaining that he could make deposits and withdrawals using the guild card. As she spoke, she noticed Toyumi's distraction, which was indeed caused by her beauty. She informed him that his card had not yet accepted any quests, and that if he did not accept a quest within a month, his card would expire. She mentioned that there were occasional requests to supply horned rabbits and advised him to acquire the minimum necessary tools and equipment. She warned that adventurers sometimes encounter more perilous monsters in the woods than horned rabbits. Toyumi thanked her for the guidance. Later, Toyumi was found in the library, immersing himself in the study of this new world. He learned that the kingdom he resided in was named the Latina Kingdom, with the royal capital at its heart. Counts governed cities in each cardinal direction, and the Count of the West lived in the western city, which appeared to be the region's hub and was quite large. Toyumi aspired to visit the southern cities, considering using his boat's summoning ability, although he had yet to sail. He discovered that the races inhabiting this world were those commonly found in fantasy tales, dwarves, elves, and beastmen. Upon reaching the section about everyday magic, he pondered whether to delve into it later, as he planned to go shopping that day. Thus, he left to purchase his adventurer set and returned to the guild to select a quest. He chose one involving horned rabbits, and upon arrival, the beast lady complimented his adventurer set, remarking that he now looked like a proper adventurer, which made Toyumi blush. Toyumi ventured into the woods to hunt horned rabbits. After a successful hunt, 
He was preparing to leave when a large goblin appeared, poised to attack. Although Toyumi was initially scared and shocked, he realized the goblin's attacks couldn't reach him due to the ship's barrier. However, as the goblin continued to strike the barrier, Toyumi panicked, fearing it might not withstand the assault. In his haste, he abandoned the ship and the rabbits, fleeing until he was sure he had lost the goblin. Frustrated and concerned about the abandoned rabbits and the lurking goblin, Toyumi was determined not to fail his first quest. The thought of summoning the ship crossed his mind, hoping the goblin wouldn't return. Upon summoning the ship, he was relieved to find all his belongings intact. Returning to the guild, he delivered the eight horned rabbits required for the quest to the Beast Lady, who confirmed their excellent condition. This successful delivery not only earned him a substantial reward, but also the realization that horned rabbits were in high demand. Toyumi was pleased to discover a new aspect of his skill. Any items left on the ship would remain safe when it was summoned back. With this knowledge, he understood he no longer needed to carry his belongings everywhere. After collecting his reward, he found himself in possession of two silver coins and 40 copper coins, enough to afford a rubber raft. Seeking solitude, Toyumi accessed his status screen, placed two silver coins in the designated slot, and watched as the ship materialized. He lay down inside, contemplating future comforts like a blanket and a table for breaks. As he relaxed, an invisible being with a star tattoo on its forehead observed him from a distance. The being muttered to itself, hinting at a need for action in Toyumi Wataru's life, suggesting that things wouldn't always remain as they were. It has been a month since Toyumi arrived in this new world. He found himself at the doctor's office, where the doctor inquired how he could assist him. Toyumi explained that as a child, he was unable to learn life magic. The doctor offered to help by circulating some magic through his body for about five minutes to see if it would aid him, mentioning the medical fee would be 10 copper coins. In this world, magic exists, and among the various types, everyday magic is a simple form that nearly everyone can use for tasks like creating sparks, releasing a small amount of water, and generating wind. The doctor began to inject magic into Toyumi's body by holding his hand, asking if he could feel the magic flowing through him. Toyumi felt a warm power spreading from the doctor's hand throughout his body and a tiny jolt of magic alongside it, making him wonder if this was his own magic. He described his sensations to the doctor, who then questioned if he possessed a small amount of magic power. The doctor advised him to concentrate magic power at his fingertips and used his own fingertip to draw a magical circle in the air. Following this, Toyumi managed to conjure a small fire at his fingertip, delighted that he had finally activated his magic. The doctor suggested that practicing more would help him improve. On his way back from the doctor's office, Toyumi observed various people heading to church, which made him curious about the kind of god that existed in this world. He considered praying but decided to postpone it as he was late for work. Returning to the guild, he selected two quests to hunt horned rabbits. As he was about to leave, a lady pleaded with a guild attendant, needing a horned rabbit that day. Overhearing their conversation, Toyumi approached and offered to bring extra from his hunt in exchange for a taste of her roasted rabbit. The woman was pleased, considering it a small price for her request. Toyumi then headed to the woods, reminding himself to do his best as many people were counting on him for horned rabbits. He summoned his rubber raft, which now had a gazebo built on it, thanks to a carpenter he had hired a while ago. That day, he harvested 55 horned rabbits, completing five requests and earning five silver coins and 36 copper coins. Afterwards, he visited the cook's shop, where she greeted him warmly, having anticipated his arrival. She served him the delicacy of roasted horned rabbit, which was so delicious that it made his mouth water. She mentioned praying at the church the previous day. The next day, after returning to the guild, a beast lady suggested that Toyumi take a day off to go to church and pray, as he had been working tirelessly since becoming an adventurer. It became clear to Toyumi that he was being drawn to the church, and he wanted to express gratitude for his skills. He headed to the church, and upon entering, he saw a large statue, which made him wonder if this was indeed their god. The atmosphere inside the church felt different from the outside. Kneeling to pray, he was suddenly transported to the realm of the gods. Opening his eyes, he saw a small boy resembling the statue in the church, leading him to question if this boy was truly the god of the people. The boy questioned Toyumi about his lack of adventure, expressing his disappointment and revealing that he had been anticipating Toyumi's arrival for some time. Gathering his courage, Toyumi inquired if the boy was a deity, to which the boy affirmed, declaring himself the creator of this world. He admitted the difficulty in bringing Toyumi here, 
suggesting Toyumi's faith might not be strong. Grateful, Toyumi thanked the deity for bestowing upon him remarkable abilities. The god explained that Toyumi's summoning was due to his mundane actions. Despite observing Toyumi's every move, he had only hunted horned rabbits, leading to complaints from other deities. This revelation startled Toyumi, who questioned why he was under surveillance. The god clarified that as someone from another world, his actions were expected to be unpredictable, yet Toyumi's were disappointingly average. The deity elaborated that he had intentionally granted Toyumi a modest skill to prevent the misuse seen with otherworldly visitors who, despite stronger abilities, utilize them more effectively. He hinted that if Toyumi could afford a luxury liner ship, he could return to a life of comfort, indulging in familiar foods, watching DVDs, and playing games. This prospect excited Toyumi, fueling his determination to harness his skills more diligently to accumulate wealth for the ship. With newfound motivation, he left the church, eager to exploit his abilities to their fullest potential. He pondered the purchase of a luxury liner priced at 500 platinum coins, a sum equivalent to 500 billion yen. Recalling the deity's teachings, he noted three key points. First, by using the magic circle during ship summoning, he would appear in the desired location on board. Second, while the ship is being repatriated, time halts for the onboard items. And third, acquiring a new ship would enhance his ship summoning level. He deduced that his abilities were better suited for trading and considered traveling to the southern coastal city to find a route there. Returning to the guild, he inquired with the beast lady about the journey. Her initial sadness at losing a supplier of horned rabbits quickly turned to helpfulness as she explained the route and advised hiring a bodyguard due to its perilous nature. After expressing his gratitude, Wataru was approached by a group interested in hunting horned rabbits for their lucrative value. Aldo, their leader, introduced himself, and Wataru reciprocated, assuring them that the abundance of horned rabbits meant no competition for resources. He offered hunting tips and subsequently enrolled in a class to master weaponry such as spears and bows. Days later, Aldo's team invited Wataru on a goblin hunt, where he triumphantly killed his first goblin. Celebrating their victory at a bar, they inquired about his departure, to which he replied it was a month away. He intended to bid farewell to the beast lady at the guild, but a long queue led him to a grumpy old man with no weight. The man acknowledged Wataru's contribution to the increased hunting of horned rabbits and wished him well. On the day of his departure, a carriage dropped him at the port, marking the start of his solitary journey. Following the god's instructions, he stepped onto the summoning circle, and his ship materialized in the water. As he sailed, he spotted a menacing bandit camp from afar, but continued on. Soon after, he encountered a group of adventurous girls who demanded his identity, threatening harm if he acted suspiciously. Wataru could sense the strength of all the girls at the party just by looking at them. He introduced himself as a mere adventurer traveling through, warning them of nearby bandits. The party leader sent some members to scout for confirmation. As they departed, Wataru attempted to continue steering his boat, but the leader restrained him, expressing distrust and suspecting a trap. Consequently, Wataru stayed, passing time with fantasies of being in the company of such attractive girls. Shortly after the scouts returned, verifying Wataru's claims, the leader apologized for her suspicion. The scouts reported a bounty on the bandits, and the leader informed Wataru they would pursue it, owing him a favor and promising a reward upon their next meeting. The adventurers departed, and Wataru sailed on, soon spotting the southern city. He observed various boats, including self-propelled ones, and felt relieved his motorboat wouldn't stand out. He docked and ventured into the city, noting its distinct atmosphere from the western city. Seeking the commercial guild, he received directions from a local. At the guild, Wataru met a lady at the desk and inquired about joining despite his membership in the Adventurer's Guild. She affirmed, and upon learning of his ship, she detailed potential jobs. She remarked on the rarity of magic ships and outlined lucrative work transporting people to destinations like the Royal Capital or the Southeastern Island, known for rare herbs and formidable monsters. The path there was treacherous, navigable only by small boats due to shallow waters, rocks, and strong currents, with only four ships capable of the journey. She offered 10 silver coins per passenger per day for such trips. Enticed, Wataru joined the commercial guild immediately. The lady informed him of the annual dues and mooring fees, totaling six silver coins. She merged his adventurer guild card with his new commercial guild membership and assigned him mooring space number 115. Grateful, Wataru introduced himself 
and the lady named Camille reciprocated, expressing eagerness to work together. Wataru was pleased to have made the acquaintance of the Beast Lady. He reserved a room at an inn which featured a single bed and a splendid view of the ocean, even though the room was priced at 50 copper coins per night, inclusive of breakfast and hot water for bathing. The following morning, Wataru rose early to purchase and call forth a motorboat, prepared to ferry passengers to the island. Utilizing his distinctive abilities, he camouflaged his sophisticated vessel to avoid drawing attention. The journey to the island took slightly under five hours, and upon arrival he was greeted by a man who remarked on Wataru's unfamiliarity. Introducing himself as a newcomer who had acquired a ship and registered with the Adventurer's Guild, Wataru met Guido, who welcomed him and briefed him on the job. Guido explained that adventurers who ventured into the forest seldom returned before several days had passed unless they sustained injuries necessitating immediate return to the city. Wataru's return from the island was swifter than anticipated. As he disembarked at the port, a hooded figure spotted and stealthily trailed him. After shopping for clothes and utensils for his new apartment, Wataru was ambushed by the hooded man, who brandished a knife and demanded ownership of Wataru's ship. In a state of panic, Wataru fled, seeking refuge in the guild where he implored for help. Camille, the receptionist, inquired about the commotion. Upon learning of the situation, she warned him that his ship's capability to navigate to the southeastern island had made him a target. In his distress, Wataru sought advice on how to proceed and inquired about Guido's well-being. Camille suggested that some individuals hire escorts or purchase slaves for protection. At that moment, an elderly man entered. The guildmaster, short in stature, offered his assistance by providing an escort, contingent upon Wataru completing an errand for him at the commission, to which Wataru consented. The subsequent day, Wataru and Camille loaded the provisions supplied by the guild into the carriage. Wataru was taken aback upon seeing the escort provided by the guild. They were the female adventurer team he had encountered en route to the southern city. Known as members of the Girasol, these women held the esteemed rank of A within the adventurer's party. Guildo, who was on the island, greeted Wataru warmly and introduced him to his companions. It was clear to Wataru that Guildo and his friends were fans of Team Girasoli, admiring the lady's strength and beauty and noting their A-rank adventurer status. Guildo cautioned Wataru against taking private jobs, advising him to work through the commercial guild to avoid potential traps and trouble. With five days of freedom ahead, Wataru decided to pass the time by cooking chicken soup using bones he had acquired for free while shopping. He recalled a cooking method he had seen on TV. As he cooked, he talked to himself, prompting Gildo to observe him from a distance and remark on his peculiarity. Wataru then practiced with his bow and arrows, and after finishing, he spent the day playing with a slime. Thus, he concluded his first day on the island. On the fourth day, Wataru contemplated building a floating cottage on the water. On the fifth day, the Jira Soul team returned with a massive tiger, a subspecies of the saber tiger. Exhausted, the team members lay on the ground unable to move. Wataru commended them on their impressive catch. Alessia responded that the Count wanted it stuffed. Wataru offered the girls wet cloths to refresh themselves, a practice none of them had experienced before. As they wiped their bodies, they felt invigorated, remarking on the novel sensation compared to bathing. Wataru presented the girls with the chicken soup he had been perfecting over the last five days. Upon tasting it, the girls found it exceptionally delicious. One girl remarked that despite the soup's vegetable ingredients, she could discern the flavor of chicken and expressed a desire to know the recipe, hoping to recreate it during her vacation. Wataru graciously agreed to share his recipe. After they boarded the boat and set off for the city, Wataru felt a sense of pride knowing the girls appreciated his culinary skills and he was pleased with the substantial earnings he had made in a short period. He resolved to maintain his job while remaining inconspicuous in town. As they neared the port, the city's inhabitants noticed the large tiger aboard Wataru's boat, prompting them to gather and welcome Team Girasol. The crowd marveled at the tiger's size and questioned whether it hailed from the southeastern island. It was then that the Girasoli team realized their oversight. They should have covered the tiger with a cloth. Internally, Wataru was dismayed that his first successful venture as a merchant had drawn so much attention as he had intended to keep a low profile. The following morning, a merchant named Zabo approached Wataru, inquiring if he would be interested in signing an exclusive contract. However, Wataru declined, explaining that all his work is conducted through the guild. He requested Zabo to leave if he was not willing to engage through the guild. 
Other merchants, having heard of his remarkable magic ships, also approached him with similar proposals. Some even tried to entice him with money, promising to double whatever the guild was paying him. Yet, he declined all offers and asked them to leave. By this time, Wataru had two escorts in the city, both men. One was named Dino and the other Enrico. They informed Wataru that it might take a while for the merchants to stop persuading him to sign a contract. Wataru thought to himself that the Saber Tiger mission was a mistake. It was evident from the mission that only his ship could carry a load of that size. From then on, merchants have been persistently trying to persuade him to sign a contract. Thanks to his escorts, Wataru has been able to move around the city freely and safely. Excited to get to work, Wataru visited a builder's shop with his escorts. He asked the builder to construct an assemblable raft and a wooden bathtub. The builder quoted a price of 70 silver coins, which Wataru agreed to pay. He trusted the builder as he was recommended by Camille, despite the high price. Three days later, the builder delivered the raft and taught Wataru how to assemble it. Shortly after, the guild called Wataru for a job. The Girasol team had chosen his ship for their next mission and apologized for the trouble they caused him on their last mission. As they set off, one of the girls thanked Wataru for his chicken soup recipe and the kelp stock he had given her. Wataru was pleased to hear this. Upon reaching the island, the girls immediately headed to the woods. Once again, Wataru saw Guido on the island. When Guido asked about the woods Wataru had brought, Wataru explained that he planned to build a raft. Guido offered to help him assemble it as he was free at the moment. They both put the raft together and Wataru noticed he could lift the large woods, something he was sure he couldn't do back in Japan. He checked his status and observed that his level had been steadily increasing since he arrived in this world. He was now at level 20. After a short while, they finished building the raft and loaded the bathtub onto it. Wataru was pleased with his setup. He acknowledged that it was expensive, but as a Japanese, he couldn't compromise on a bath. That night, he soaked in the bath for a long time, filling the tub with everyday magic and warming the water with a heated stone. Wataru relished his first bath in this new world, taking his time to enjoy the stunning oceanic view. Shortly after, the girls returned from their outing. He noted their early return, to which they responded that they had already found many good items. Wataru then revealed a surprise he had prepared for them. He led them to a boat where he had built a bathtub and raft. The girls were astonished, admitting that they thought only aristocrats and wealthy merchants could own such luxuries. Wataru suggested that they try it out, claiming it was a great way to relieve stress. However, two of the girls, Carla and Claretta, declined out of fear. This was the first time Wataru had encountered adults who were afraid of bathing, but he hid his surprise. He reassured them that it was okay and returned to camp with them, instructing the remaining girls to call him if they needed anything while bathing. Back at camp, he could hear the girls' giggles from the bath, indicating they were enjoying themselves. Carla and Claretta asked Wataru if it was a big deal if someone didn't bathe. He responded that while there are people who don't bathe, he believed it would be a significant loss not to experience it in life. He reassured them that it wasn't scary and encouraged them to try it slowly. Eventually, they mustered the courage to bathe and returned with smiles on their faces, expressing how refreshing it was and how glad they were to have tried it. Wataru was pleased to see their happy faces again. As he relaxed at the camp, unbeknownst to him, he was being accused of theft back in the city. Upon their return to the city, the girls offered to accompany Wataru back to the guild. Upon reaching the guild entrance, Wataru bid the girls farewell, assuring them that his escorts would arrive soon. The ladies encouraged him to ask for their assistance whenever he needed, whether it was a hot bath or a meal, as a token of their gratitude for his help. After bidding him goodbye, they left. Suddenly, Camille rushed out, alarming Wataru with news of a problem. Before she could explain, a group of men appeared, declaring Wataru's arrest on suspicion of theft from the Zabo family. As they approached, Wataru's escorts intervened, overpowering the men. The guildmaster emerged, ordering the Zabo men to leave due to their lack of an arrest warrant. Confused, Wataru listened as the guildmaster explained that a merchant named Zabo had accused him of stealing a family heirloom, his ship. One of Wataru's escorts remembered Zabo as a merchant Wataru had previously refused to sign a private contract with. The guildmaster added that Zabo had a history of dishonesty. Wataru realized that Zabo was attempting to seize his ship because he had declined to sign a contract with him. He asked the guildmaster how Zabo could be so audacious. 
the guildmaster explained that while Zabo's approach was typically ineffective, he had the backing of a nobleman, Baron Benvenuto. Wataru inquired about his next steps. The guildmaster informed him that he would have to endure a trial by fire, appearing in court to defend his case. This would be Wataru's first trial in another world. In court, Wataru faced Zabo and his noble supporter, Baron Benvenuto. Recognizing Zabo as a merchant he had previously rejected, Wataru prepared to defend himself. When the judge asked if he had anything to say against Zabo's claims, Wataru affirmed, addressing the judge respectfully. He insisted that the ship was not Zabo's, as he had purchased it with his own money. Zabo countered, accusing Wataru of lying and claiming the magic ship as a family heirloom that Baron Benvenuto had once ridden. The Baron corroborated Zabo's claim, asserting that he recognized the ship as Zabo's despite the passage of time. Wataru cast a disappointed glance, finding it hard to believe that a man of nobility could utter such a blatant lie. The judge, once again, turned to Wataru, asking if he had anything to counter their claim. Wataru responded affirmatively, stating that he would prefer to justify himself through actions rather than words. He proposed to use the ship itself as his defense, to which the judge agreed. The ship was brought into the courtroom, and Wataru challenged Zabo to activate it, given his claim that the ship belonged to his family. Zabo, confident in his abilities, thought it was just another magic ship that could be activated by magic. He poured an abundance of magic into it, but to his surprise, the ship remained inactive. Wataru, with a smile hidden in his mind, knew that the ship was not a magic ship, but a motor ship that could only be activated by a key. Zabo, realizing his efforts were in vain, turned to the judge, claiming that the ship was broken. The judge, however, dismissed his claim, stating that all of Zabo's claims were false and that he, along with Baron Benvenuto, would be punished for their long-standing evil deeds. Wataru was relieved to have won the trial. They celebrated their victory with a chicken dinner. As they left the court, Wataru approached the guildmaster, expressing his surprise at the Count's presence. The old man responded, stating that it was his doing. Wataru acknowledged the old man's importance in the city, to which the old man chuckled, admitting that they had been trying to apprehend Zabo and Baron for their evil deeds, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity, which is why he invited the Count. The old man congratulated Wataru on his victory. Wataru Toyumi had triumphed over the villain, and the case was now closed. However, the town remained unchanged, rife with assault and bribery. Wataru spent his days fulfilling requests and visiting the island. Over time, Guido and the others learned how to build rafts and bathtubs, transforming the island into a resort-like place. By now, Wataru had gotten to know more people, allowing him to work with teams other than the Girasol team. He had also improved his cooking skills. After six months, his savings on the card amounted to four white gold coins, 68 gold coins, and 80 silver coins, which converted to about 740 million yen. As he lay in bed, he realized that he needed about 50 billion yen to buy the luxury liner. At his current rate, it would take more than 50 years to amass such a sum. To expedite the process, he planned to go to the continent beyond the sea, buy a new boat, and trade with the southern continent. Wataru conducts research on the pepper trade, and he discovers that it is the most common method of getting money around the world. He also discovers that it takes a month to transport pepper back from the southern continents using a magic ship, and he also learns that it brings in enormous profits. It is going to be a long trip to the southern continent, so having a large deck will be nice. Camille from the Commercial Guild says, There are large monsters out in the open sea, and only one in 30 ships is typically able to return safely from the southern continent. The fact that Camille did not want him to fly to the southern continent is something that he remembers, but he is relieved that she is concerned about him because he is aware that his ship is unsinkable and that he will be okay. When Guido walks up to him, Wataru is shocked to see that he is drinking during the day and begs him not to since he could have to sail a ship in an emergency. Guido assures him that it is only one drink and that he should not worry. When he asks why he is looking at a map, Wataru responds that he is considering traveling to the southern continent. But Guido objects, pointing out that it would be risky and questioning whether he is truly in need of money. Wataru claims he simply felt he should give the trade a shot because he was able to obtain a decent magic ship. And he believes that if it weren't for the pressure he has been receiving from God, he would not have considered traveling. Wataru responds that he does not think he can have them follow him to the southern continent because he does not think three guys traveling together on a boat is a good idea. 
Guido wonders if he will be going with his escorts because the southern continent is not a safe location. Wataru reasons that owning slaves might be a normal thing in this world, but he has never thought about buying one for himself. He wonders if a person gets to meet their destined one when transported to another world. Guido advises him to take advantage of the opportunity to buy some slaves, saying he will not have to worry about them betraying him and that there are skilled men there. Wataru tells the Girasol party that he is going to the southern continent, which makes them all sad. They warn him to be careful and thank him for making the island a safe and comfortable place to stay. In appreciation, they bring out a small gift for Wataru, explaining that it is a rare species of slime that is the offspring of a holy slime. Wataru, who has always wanted a lime, is overjoyed and says that he would have traveled with it if he had the taming skill. He gives the slime some dried meat and it says that it tastes good. He quickly calls attention to the party because the slime seems to have spoken, but they tell him that slime cannot speak. He insists that he heard it speak, and Claretta tells him that this is because of his taming skills. He checks, and he discovers that he now possesses the taming skill. Iruma informs Wataru that he will need to sign a contract with the slime and demonstrates the process. After some convincing, the slime decides to accompany him, and Wataru is happy that he now has the taming talent and may retain the slime. After discussing his intention to travel to the southern continent, which she still finds objectionable, Camille registers the holy slime as Rima, as Wataru's deputy at the commercial guard. He then asks her to introduce him to a slave trader. Wataru takes Enrico and Dino to a slave trade center, where they are greeted with open arms and introduced to Duccio, the center's head. Duccio asks whether Wataru is searching for a female slave to serve as an escort. He replies that he must first explain the concept of slaves. He distinguishes between two kinds of slaves, criminal slaves, who have committed a crime and lost their freedom to slavery, and debt slaves, who sold themselves in order to pay off debts. He further states that criminal slaves are typically pushed into forced labor, which is what Wataru is searching for. Duccio goes on to say that there are laws that apply to debt slaves. For example, masters are not allowed to kill slaves, force them to commit violent or disorderly crimes, or fail to provide a minimum amount of food, clothing, or shelter. Slaves also have to obey their master completely, not be allowed to flee and maintain strict confidentiality. The final rule states that a contract with a slave is established with the god of trade. Therefore, Wataru reasoned that the punishments must be intended to safeguard the slaves, and if someone breaks the laws, the god will punish them. Even though it might be a little more costly, Duccio promises to introduce Wataru to the pride of the center, just as the guildmaster did. Wataru asks how much he means by expensive, and Duccio replies that it will only cost 30 gold coins each. Wataru is taken aback, but since he can afford it, he requests to meet the slaves. Duccio then brings in the two slaves and introduces them as Felicia of the Dark Elves and Inez of the Flame Tiger Tribe. When Duccio asks Wataru if he likes the slaves, he responds that he does, adding that they are both lovely and that it will be fantastic to have them both as his escorts. If they are that good, then there should be many wealthy people who can afford to spend 30 gold coins on them. Duccio explains that the two slaves draw a lot of buyers so they can select the most advantageous master for themselves, but many customers have tried to bargain with them and failed. He says that negotiations will take place in private between the three of them and that all conversations will remain confidential because the room is shielded from the god of commerce. As Duccio exits the room, Wataru is confused and wonders how to win them over. He knows he can't tell them he's from another planet because they'll probably just think he's odd, so he introduces himself and wants to see their status and obtain their name. He asks them how they became slaves after Ines and Felicia introduced themselves and revealed their status. Ines responds that it was a gambling debt, while Felicia explains that she sold herself to help her people survive after their village was attacked by demi-human hunters. Inez is so casual as she sits there, and Wataru notices. She tells him she used to be a B-rank adventurer, so she could always pay off her debts. However, after getting hurt in Labyrinth City, she was unable to meet her repayment obligations, which led to her accruing more debt, which is why she sold herself. Inez also says she doesn't want to give up gambling and is seeking a kind and understanding master. Felicia goes on to say that she is the daughter of the chief of a community of dark elves that live in the forest and that the hunters who attacked her village were members of a nation that practices human supremacy and who used force to enslave and transport the dark elves for sale. Felicia continues, asking if he would assist her in finding a place where the dark elves can live in peace and safety.
If he can grant her wish, Felicia promises to give him everything. Wataru acknowledges that this is a big responsibility. Still, he thinks that if he searches the ocean by boat, he may find uninhabited islands where people can live. And for Ines, he thinks the luxury liner will attract her attention. He tells the ladies that he might be able to fulfill both of their requests. He then demonstrates to them his special ability by summoning a ship. They are startled to see the boat, and Ines feels like she has bumped her head against something. Felicia says it's a barrier, and Wataru explains that he can use this ability to summon a ship that cannot be submerged, destroyed, or invaded. He then offers them the chance to attack the ship to test it. He continues by saying that he intends to purchase a bigger ship with the same characteristics soon and sail to the southern continent for trade. Ines uses her power to smash through the barrier, but the boat is unharmed. Wataru turns to face Felicia and tells her that, in addition to conducting business, they may search for deserted islands where people can dwell. He adds that he cannot ensure they will find one, but if they do, he will assist in getting her people there. Ines asks if it's real, and he swears on the god of commerce to prove it. She brings up the price and he says it might take some time, but he will buy the boat if business goes well. He then shows her an image of the luxury liner and tells her he plans to buy the boat. He explained that the boat was like a town inside, with all kinds of shops, a wide variety of food, alcohol, and even a casino for her to enjoy. Wataru tries to convince them that his boat is unbreakable and unsinkable, but the two women look at themselves and say they will cooperate with him since they know he is weak and needs protection. Wataru informs Rimu that they have new friends once the contract is signed. Ines responds that she neglected to disclose a crucial condition before and asks Wataru to care for her. He promises Felicia that he won't treat her violently when she expresses that she doesn't mind if he treats her roughly, but that her community is her concern. After that, Wataru prepared for the trip, while Ines and Felicia studied how to protect someone from Enrico and Dino in a city. The three of them are on Wataru's boat on the day of their journey when he pulls out his status screen to purchase a new vessel. Once he does, he calls forth a larger ship than the one they initially set off in. After explaining that the boat is named Cruiser, Wataru thinks they should rename it Klugo. Ines wonders if that is the name they should use, and after giving it some thought, he happily announces they may now travel to the southern continent. Before returning to the city, Wataru hides the new ship. Camille, who has never seen a ship like it before, is shocked to see such an incredible vessel. She tells him it is quite odd and wonders where it was unearthed from. Wataru quickly turns to Inez to get confirmation, because he has no idea that ships are excavated in this world. She informs him that they are, and she is even surprised that he is unaware of this. Wataru responds that he doesn't want anyone to question him, and asks Camille if the textiles he ordered are ready, because he doesn't want anyone to question him. She then tells him she heard their currency can also be used on the southern continent. The situation may change depending on the political situation, but with both money and goods to sell, she is sure he will be able to purchase pepper there. She says with the one platinum coin he gave them, they were able to prepare 80 yards of silk, which they should sell for a high price on the southern continent. Watatu thanks Camille for all of her assistance, but she advises him not to bring it up because he is willing to sell the pepper he brings back to the commercial guild, so they will undoubtedly assist him. She then requires him to get a lot of pepper and return safely. He swears to do his best. Enrico and Dino bid him farewell as he left and cautioned him to be careful out there. He also thanked them for looking after him as he left for the southern continent. As Watatu steers the ship, he thinks that the month-long boat trip has begun. Since purchasing the cruiser, his ship summoning ability has increased to level 3, and it now has the autopilot ability, which only functions when the ship is on water, but allows it to navigate to any location he has previously visited. The ship can also move while he is sleeping, making cross-continent travel easy, but he still needs to get there on his own the first time. When Wataru invites Ines and Felicia to tea, they all sit on the deck, and he asks them if they like the ship and if there is anything they do not understand, like how to use the appliances. Wataru looks around him as he travels, studying the maps and taking in the sights of the dolphins swimming in the sea and birds flying. Ines adds that the appliances are also not magical, making the whole thing extremely mysterious. Wataru informs them that although the ship was built in a world devoid of magic, he believes that magic is still present, because when he wishes for fuel or water, it replenishes itself. Wataru tries to divert their attention by asking if they have seen the bedroom, as the beds are of the highest caliber. The ladies agree, stating that the beds are soft and look amazing to sleep on. 
Ines and Felicia are taken aback by the fact that the ship comes from a world devoid of magic. The women are shocked to learn that they do not share a bedroom. Felicia explains that they are his bodyguards, so she assumes they will be together even at night. He then tells them there are three bedrooms, so they may each have one for themselves. Wataru remarks it is a fair idea and that they should sleep together since it is safer that way after imagining what it would be like to lie between Ines and Felicia. When he notices some ripples in the water, he shows them and asks if they know what it is. As they stare at it together, wondering what could be in the water that caused such bubbling, a sea serpent emerges from the water. The ladies tease him about it, but he gets over it and says he is feeling fired up. They decide to fight the monster after the sea snake assaults the ship, but is repelled by the barrier. Felicia pulls out weapons and instructs Wataru to hit the creature before they attack, so that after she and Ines kill it, they may all level up. Then, Wataru argues that since Rimu is only level 1, they should let him get a hit as well. Wataru then shoots the monster with an arrow, and Rimu shoots the monster with one of his snack nuts. Ines and Felicia then team up to battle the monster together, and they ultimately kill it, much to their joy. When Wataru examines their condition, he discovers that Rimu's level has climbed by 32, Ines has increased by 7, and Felicia has increased by 5. Wataru is shocked and says he did not know that, and the women ask him if he is from another planet. Felicia informs the others that as their level rises, their bodies become stronger, and they can also live longer. She even mentions a legend about a level 700 hero who lived to be a thousand years old. Wataru decides to tell them about him and orders them to keep it a secret that he is from another world. They comply. He asks them how they know that. Inez responds that he was not hiding it well at all because he lacks general knowledge and can also operate the mysterious ship. She then asks if the world, without the magic that he mentioned earlier, is where he is from. As they travel on, taking down various marine creatures and drawing nearer to themselves, Wataru finally spots land on the 25th day, signifying that they have reached the southern continent. They run out, relieved to have finally arrived, and Wataru informs the others he can see the southern continent. They arrived in 25 days, five days ahead of plan, so they should approach the beach and search for any human settlements. Felicia asks him what language he speaks in his native world, and he recalls that he has the special ability known as language comprehension, so there's no need to worry. Inez reminds him that they do not speak the language of the southern continent, and they both panicked because they did not consider that during their journey. Happily, they leap off the boat and land in a little village. Felicia uses barrier magic on Wataru, who says they won't be allowed to conduct business there, and they should find someone to inquire about the existence of a city nearby. They spot a man and go up to talk to him. He leads them to the village and informs the others about them. Glauco, the local head, invites them into his home, and the other villagers watch through the door as they introduce themselves. Glauco replies that Tevoli is a city approximately 10 days away by foot. Wataru tells Glauco that he came to the southern continent to trade and asks if he knows of any major port cities. Glauco also informs Wataru that about two months ago, the king of their nation, Catania, passed away, which led to a succession war. Wataru then asks if this means a civil war is still going on. Wataru asks what the situation is like in Tavoli, to which Glauco responds that he has heard from certain close-knit merchants that although it hasn't escalated to an armed confrontation, it appears that the public order there has gotten worse. Following the unexpected demise of the king, the first and second princes are now vying for the throne. The mother of the first prince is a foreign-born legal wife who married into the royal family, while the mother of the second prince is a concubine who happens to be a lady from the prime minister's household. The prime minister went on to say that the second prince should take the throne because the first prince was unworthy. The princes are both assembling armies, and Glauco tells Wataru to exercise caution if he intends to visit Tavoli because there are more and more mercenaries and other boisterous types there. Inez and Felicia respond that they should be able to handle some level of danger. Therefore, they should at least have a look at the city's appearance when Watari tells them what Glauco told him about the continent. After traveling for a few days, they finally arrive in the city, where they are astounded by its enormity. Wataru remarks that the market appears more tranquil than he had anticipated. Several men then approach the women and demand that they go out and have some fun rather than spend their time with Wataru, whom they refer to as a boring guy. Ines asks Wataru if he is getting shaken down, and he accepts. Wataru wonders why he always ends up attracting bad bunch of men. 
He tells the men the girls are his escorts, therefore he must refuse. The men declare they are not talking to him. When the men try to attack Wataru, Inez and Felicia hit them. And when Felicia uses magic, the guys back down and admit they can't compete with magic. When some guards show up, the men flee, and Wataru advises the women to go as well to avoid trouble. After evading the guards, Ines approaches Wataru to inquire what they will do about the thugs in the city. He replies that since the stalls are still open, they should be able to get Pepper, and that since Camille mentioned a guild on the continent, they ought to go there as well. They approach a man and ask him for directions. He asks for money, and after receiving it from Wataru, he leads them to the commercial guild. Upon entering the guild's passageway, several vendors approach them and try to sell them lamps, traditional fabrics, juice, clothing, and other items. Wataru quickly moves on, telling the women no, but thank you. As they exit the passageway, a little girl gives Felicia a flower, but as she picks it up, the girl asks for ten copper coins. Wataru pays as she apologizes, and the little girl runs off. Felicia asks if they could not have listened to the people, but Ines tells her that if they buy one thing, that is it. After traveling for two hours, they arrive at the commercial guild and approach the receptionist. Wataru identifies them as being from the northern continent and requests to talk with a representative. The man leads them into a different room. They are greeted there by a woman who introduces herself as Maya, the vice manager of the guild. Wataru also introduces himself, and he asks whether he will be able to conduct business given the unstable political climate. Mia tells him that he can, even with the unrest in the city, and that pepper is now half its price because the nobles are eager to use it as war money. She then requests his budget. Maya looks happy, telling Wataru that he is blessed with good fortune, as if the war had already started and that they will not be able to sell such luxury items. She also tells him that she will verify the quantity of spider silk he brought the following day and suggests that they stay at the inn that the guild manages. As they leave the guild, Wataru, Inez, and Felicia appear overwhelmed. Felicia remarks that people on the continent are very good at conducting business. Just as they are about to go touring, some men approach them and tell them they have located some nice women. The following day, Wataru serves Rimu, whom he keeps in his bag, some food, and he remarks that it is good. The ladies enjoy a delectable breakfast at the inn, and they praise the chef for using excellent spices. When Felicia asks Wataru what their plans are for the day, he replies that they have to go to the commercial guild during the day so that they can buy his spider silk. He speculates that they might not have much time for sightseeing because they were interrupted a lot the day before and that public order is poor throughout the continent. But Wataru believes that their striking beauty is the reason they were disturbed. He tells them that because of the ongoing civil upheaval, he wants to depart the nation after their job is done, but not before asking them to collect some food supplies for the trip back and keepsakes for everyone in the southern city. When they ask him what he intends to buy, he replies, some liquor for the guild master. However, a woman carrying their fruit juice interrupts him and expresses amazement that they are dressed in foreign clothing. Wataru then takes Felicia and Ines shopping to buy them new clothes. The women showered him with gratitude for the lovely gowns, and when Felicia inquires about whether it's really okay to purchase them, he reassures her that they are secondhand and that wearing local clothing will make them blend in better. Ines exclaims with joy, that her fabric has a type of thread woven in that shimmers in the light. When the woman tells Wataru that the fabric is only five silver coins, he is shocked but decides to buy it anyway because he remembers Camille. As they leave the market, they also pick up some food supplies and liquor for Ines. Wataru asks Felicia if she has any more questions, but she replies that she is fine. When he sees that someone is selling the identical fabric he previously purchased, he checks the price tag and discovers that the fabric, which he paid 50,000 yen for, is actually only being sold for 5,000 yen. He also notices that the liquor is being sold for half the price he paid for it, which depresses him and makes him say that doing business is scary. Inez tells him that haggling is exciting and that he should do his best because she doesn't speak the language. She also says that since he is going to buy a lot of pepper, they should drive a hard bargain and convince the guild to buy their silk at a premium price. When they get at the guild, Mia approaches them and expresses surprise at the enormous quantity of spider silk he brought. After a little while, she says their guild has examined the spider silk and finds it to be of exceptional quality, and they are willing to buy the entire amount for five platinum coins. Wataru argues that the price he paid for the spider silk is excellent because he only paid one platinum coin for it, 
but Mia counters that selling it directly to retailers could increase his profit by the same amount. Mia feels that Ines is pushing him to negotiate, but he doesn't know any retailers to sell directly to, and he also wants to close his deal as soon as possible given the political unrest. Wataru agrees after Mia senses his reluctance and offers him an assortment spice set that would make a great memento if he sold to the guild. They also offer him an additional 5% off the pepper he purchases. Wataru informs Felicia and Enos that he was able to purchase two platinum coins worth of pepper. He also asks to be paid in pepper for the spider silk, but the guild will deliver the products later because it will take some time to manufacture that quantity. He informs Ines that he was unable to negotiate a better price, but she tells him that it doesn't really matter. He thinks they should be able to turn a big profit because he had to borrow their storage for such a large number, so they should load the pepper onto the rubber raft gradually. When the little girl's mother arrives and introduces herself to Felicia, the woman profusely thanks them, saying they truly saved them. She also explains that she and her daughter are planning to flee the civil unrest and return to their hometown, but they do not have the money. The little girl from the previous day brings some flowers to Felicia and tells her it is for 30 copper coin. Felicia tells the girl she cannot buy flowers from her anymore. Wataru acknowledges that Felicia has always been concerned about her hometown and gives her some money to give the woman after Felicia asks him what they are talking about and he clarifies. She then asks him if she can buy a flower and explains that she wants to assist them in returning to their homeland. Ines makes fun of him for being easy on Felicia but he corrects her by saying he also got her some alcohol. Wataru explains that he wanted to explore the continent, but that it would be bad if they got involved in a civil war. They load all the pepper onto the ship and prepare to return to the Klugo in order to return to the southern city. While they are returning to the southern city, they will also be searching for an island where the Dark Elves can relocate in order to care for Felicia. After settling onto the boat and leaving the southern continent, Wataru brings Rimu out, and apologizes for having to keep him in the bag while they were in the city. Inez stretches out and says she can unwind in the Klugo. Inez requests permission to take a shower, and Wataru grants it. However, Felicia objects, stating that she feels it is not appropriate for Inez to use the shower before their master. Inez then asks Wataru if he wants them to shower together. Wataru advises them to reassess their strategy after they have had time to freshen up. He also mentions that as they return to the southern continent, they are looking for Felicia's requested island, which would be ideal for immigration. Felicia has expressed concern about demi-human hunters, so if at all possible, she would like an island that is close to trade routes. She is correct, Wataru adds, and they should take a significant detour and head back the way they came. They will also keep an eye on their food supply while on board and hunt for as long as they can. Ines then says they should toast to finding an island with the alcohol from the southern continent. He says that if they locate an island, they will investigate to see if it is inhabited and whether there are any monsters or animals on it. That signals the start of their quest for an island. While they hunt for an island, they also battle various sea monsters and engage in general conversation. Occasionally, Wataru and Ines see Felicia's dejected expression. Following a few days, Wataru asks Ines how long she believes their food will last. She replies that it will last for about two weeks, and he advises them not to venture any farther. Ines responds that the open sea is even more empty than she had anticipated, so they should head back to the southern city first. Suddenly, Felicia calls and says she can see an island, but when they get there, they realize it is too small for people to live on. The woman compliments Wataru, saying he is amazing and knowledgeable, and he tells them to try searching the area for a while as there might be a larger island nearby. Wataru explains that he believes islands are formed from things like volcanic activity or earthquakes that happen at the bottom of the sea. So in a single area, they might find multiple accompanying islands that are connected to each other. He informs them that, given their food supply, they have a week to investigate the area. They do so and keep finding new islets. But after a few days, it begins to rain, forcing them to seek cover indoors. Felicia brings them tea and tells them that there is nothing they can do but wait for the rain to stop. She then says gloomily that even if it rains for a week, they will have to stop. Ines reassures Felicia that she is sure it will stop soon, and Wataru adds that she should stop pushing herself and start resting. Felicia retires to the bedroom to sleep, and upon awakening, she notices that the Klugo is moving. She looks out the window and notices that the rain has stopped, so she joyfully rushes outside to join the others. 
However, Ines meets her en route and urges her to hurry. As Felicia gets up, Wataru shows her a sizable island. They land on the island, and as they circle it, he finds that it is enormous and home to a variety of creatures. He also notes that even in the interior of the island, they can see all the way to the ocean. After exploring the island for two days, Wataru asks Felicia what she thinks of it. She replies that she doesn't detect any signs of human habitation and that the island is perfect for dark elves because it has a river, a forest, and grassy plains. She responds that the villagers will be able to handle the goblins since they have always built their settlements out of the forest and are accustomed to eliminating monsters. He reminds her that there are goblins in the forest. Felicia then asks Wataru for help in assisting the Dark Elves immigrate to the island, and he accepts, saying he will help in any way he can. Ines adds that there are wild animals there as well, making hunting appear conceivable. As they return to the southern metropolis, he consoles her as she begins to cry. While traveling, Wataru remembers that he has autopilot ability. He shows his destination on his status panel, and the ship begins to move independently, surprising him. When he walks into the bedroom, he hears Felicia and Ines conversing. They ask him if he should be there since the ship is moving, and he responds that it is utilizing the autopilot skill to navigate the ship for him as long as he has gone to the destination previously. When Felicia asks him if the ship will never stop going, he replies that it will continue to move even while he is asleep, and that, at their current rate, they should arrive in the southern metropolis in two days. Wataru agrees and suggests they talk about moving to the island. He asks her if a bottle of liquor from Tevoli would be okay for her father, but she tells him he does not need to consider that as she is just a slave. She then says that on their way back to the southern city, they will pass by a spot that is close to her village, so she would like to stop by for a visit if possible. Felicia approaches Wataru and tells him she cannot thank him enough for helping the Dark Elves find a safe place to live. And like she said when they were finalizing their contract, she intends to offer him every part of herself. Wataru then reasons that meeting Felicia's dad means he will be meeting the man who is keeping his daughter as a slave, and he imagines how it will turn into a bloodbath. Ines then tells him she is going out to the deck with Rimu, leaving him and Felicia in the room. Felicia then tries to start anything, but Wataru swiftly stops her because he is still afraid of what her father will do to him. He tells Felicia how much he values her and reminds her that they haven't fully transported the Dark Elves to the island yet, so they should concentrate on immigration for the time being. When they arrive at the Elves' village two days later, they find no one there. Ines asks Felicia what's going on, and she responds that they shouldn't move until she says so. Suddenly, they are surrounded by people wearing masks, who ask them what's under the blue stone. When Felicia tells them that it's the fairy's egg, the people take off their masks to greet her. Everyone emerges from their hiding spot to greet Felicia as she arrives home. Her father then shows up and introduces himself to Wataru as Federico, the village leader. Wataru then makes his own introduction and extends a warm invitation to everyone into his house. Federico asks him if he is really prepared to transport them to the island, even though he doesn't know them. And after detailing the immigration plan, the man breaks down in tears and says Wataru is a decent person. Federico agrees, stating that the proposal is like a dream come true, but he needs to discuss it with the village before making a choice. Wataru concurs, stating that he must go to the southern city first in order to have time to discuss it with the others. When Cecilia, Felicia's mother, comes, she offers to make them some meal so they can spend the night in their hamlet. Felicia is told to go to her mother by Wataru after he finds her yearningly staring at her mother. She resists, claiming that she must protect him, but he reassures her that Ines is with him. Federico tells Wataru that he is relieved that his daughter is doing well and that they sacrificed her for the good of the village. He would normally be embarrassed to even see her, so he thanks Wataru from the bottom of his heart for bringing his daughter back to the village and for allowing him to see her happy face. Given that the Felicia family gets along well together, Wataru hopes that everything goes smoothly during their move to the island and that everyone may live in harmony going forward. As they get ready to head to the southern metropolis, Wataru thanks everyone in Felicia's village for their hospitality. He informs Federico that, because they would be returning in a week, he should take some time to talk to his people about the migration. As they are leaving the hamlet, Felicia thanks Wataru as well, stating that she was able to have a pleasant conversation with her parents, who appear relieved. Ines compliments them on being such wonderful parents, and Wataru says he is happy to hear that. Wataru then inquires about Ines's family and whether she would like them to visit her hometown. Ines declines, 
stating that she would have to explain to her parents how she became a slave and that she has no intention of doing so. Wataru then gives up, reasoning that Ines's debt was caused by her gambling. They moved all the pepper that was put onto rubber boats and placed it on Klugo's deck as they proceeded to the southern city. However, the deck could only accommodate half of the pepper they purchased, so 20 bags of pepper were left in the rubber boat. Then, because he is excited to see everyone back in the city, he gets ready to hand out the souvenirs to everyone in the southern city. Guido visits Camille at the trade guild and informs her that he met Wataru at the dock. He has returned from the southern city and she has hurried to greet him and express her relief that he has arrived back safely. Even though it is her work, he praises her and is pleased that she came to greet him back at the harbor. He asks if they can move the pepper to the guild immediately quickly and she says they can, so she summons some men who load all the pepper effortlessly. Camille compliments him on his successful trading trip and remarks that the pepper is in perfect condition. She then says that everything comes down to 72 platinum coins, and she asks if that will be acceptable. Wataru says that will be okay and instructs her to set aside 50 platinum coins to deposit into his guild account. After that, he gives her the souvenir he purchased for her. After bringing out a bottle of liquor for the guildmaster, he surprises Camille by saying that she has helped him with many things and that he wouldn't have gotten to where he is without her. She expresses her gratitude and makes a promise to cherish the gift. When Camille questions Wataru about the southern continent, he replies that he only went to the Catania kingdom because the monarch had died unexpectedly, sparking a succession conflict. He goes on to say that by the time he returns, there might be a full-fledged civil war raging. She questions if he does not realize how risky it is and that he has already made a lot. But Wataru is certain that he wants to travel and see many other locations. She is startled that he still intends to travel to the southern continent. As of right now, the guild building Inez informs Wataru. When he told Camille he was going back into the pepper trade, she was completely shocked. He said he couldn't reassure her because he couldn't tell her about his skill. But he couldn't help but wonder why his heart was racing as soon as she gave him that look. When Felicia asks him what he is going to do next, she says that she wants to give souvenirs to a few people. She also says that she wants to meet the people who ask him if he is going to the Girasol celebration. Wataru is greeted enthusiastically by the Girasol party, who inquire about his well-being and discuss many topics. When he discovers Kara is missing, he asks about her and they inform him that she is sick in bed, pleading with him to assist her. He is taken aback by their request, but Kara emerges from it looking frail. She hugs Wataru and claims she wanted to eat Karag so much that it caused a fever. The others claim that she has been complaining about wanting to eat Karag for the past three days, and this happened every time they visited the Southeast Island. He accepts when they ask whether he would be willing to teach them how to make Karag, and he then devises a scheme for hosting a dinner party. Along with Inez and Felicia, Wataru visits the market to buy the ingredients he needs to cook. When Felicia asks what kind of meal he would be making, he replies that he will be making Karaj, so he needs to buy some chicken. When he decides to buy some oysters after seeing some, Ines is taken aback since he claims he will fry them. She remarks that it's an unusual method to eat oysters, and he understands that this is not typical in their environment. He explains that after coating the oysters in batter and frying them, they will be crispy on the outside and creamy on the inside. He then recalls that they should be dipped in tartar sauce, which means he needs mayonnaise. Wataru is capable of making mayonnaise, but he is unsure if using eggs in the world is safe. When he inquires about the lady's willingness to eat their eggs raw, they respond that they cannot as they will have a stomachache. Felicia then shares that she has heard of using purifying magic on food to make it safe to eat raw, and she believes Claretta, a priestess, may be able to employ it. Soon after, Wataru feels as though he is on a date. Claretta tells him the others will meet up with them later in the day and he says they should divide the work and start cooking. Claretta and Kara soon join them, stating they have come to learn how to cook. They then get ready to use the patio of the inn they are staying at. He asks Kara if he can ask her to help with something. She tells him she can't cook, but he tells her not to worry, as he just wants her to crush the bread into tiny pieces. He says he and Claretta will make the carage, so he will leave the vegetable to Ines, and Felicia can handle shucking the oysters and de-shelling the prawns. Everyone gets to work, and soon, Wataru asks Claretta if she can use purification magic. She says she can, and he asks her to cast it on an egg. As she does that, she asks him what he wants to do with the egg. He tells her he wants to make mayonnaise, 
and they all wonder what mayonnaise is. He then does the process to show them. He adds salt, pepper, and lemon juice to the yolk of the egg that was purified and whisks them all together. After a long while of whisking, he tells them to have a taste and they all like it. Claretta tells her to teach her how to make the mayonnaise and he tells her to purify an egg. But Rimu says he can also do it. Wataru is surprised and tells Claretta Rimu is saying he can use magic too. She says they should have him give it a go and Rimu truly purifies an egg. Wataru praises Rimu as Claretta says the egg has been properly purified and they all go back to their cooking. Everyone in Gira Sole, including Ines and Felicia, was really satisfied with the supper, which was a great success. After cooking, everyone gathers around and sits down to eat the assortment of food. Wataru returns to the Dark Elves' village six days after the celebration, but this time he meets someone he did not expect. A woman named Romano tries to attack him with an axe, claiming he is only posing to assist the villagers in their migration and that he may have tricked the village chief, but he will not. She goes on to say that if he values his life, he should release Felicia. Romano, Felicia's elder brother, marches to Wataru's home and demands that he release his younger sister. He also asks Wataru to leave the city because they will not migrate. Wataru gets worried and wonders if the villagers have plans to migrate. He asks Felicia for advice, but she suggests they wait to hear her father's thoughts. The village chief arrives with Romano's father, who asks Romano why he's causing another commotion. Still, Romano informs them that Wataru has been forcing Felicia to be his slave against her will. Felicia argues against this, but Romano asks Felicia's father, the village chief, not to listen to Wataru because he's a villain. He also reveals that if things keep going this way, Wataru might end up rearing them like chickens for Christmas. Romano calls Wataru a bastard and tells him that his plans to brainwash the village chief and Felicia have failed. Romano's father is so embarrassed by his son's behavior that he asks Romano to shut up immediately. He reminds Romano that all the villagers had voted to move and hits him with a frying pan before apologizing for the havoc his son had caused. Romano's father drags him off afterward, leaving the village chief to converse with Wataru, who was still shocked at how Romano's father had hit him. The village chief apologizes on Romano's behalf, but Wataru tells him not to worry. Romano's father calls out to him in the distance, telling him to ignore his son and continue his migration plans. Wataru remarks that some villagers still want to stay back, but the village chief tells him that Romano is simply a self-centered idiot because it is commonplace knowledge that they can't stay. The demi-human hunters had already discovered their city and planned to kill the elves as soon as they arrived. Wataru suggests they start working on their plans to migrate immediately and informs the village chief that they have already found the perfect spot on a secluded island. He remarks that the villagers had only 35 residents but would have to split the people into two groups because his ship couldn't transport all the villagers on one trip. The village chief is so stunned by Wataru's willingness to do so much for the village that he promises to name the villagers after him. But Wataru humbly advises him against it. He also tells the village chief that he had bought a year's worth of food for the villagers, some tools they could use for farming, and tents they could live in. So he suggests that they tow down the buildings that could be disassembled and carry them on his ship. That evening, the village chief briefs the villagers about their traveling arrangements. Meanwhile, Wataru remodels the interior of his ship since he doesn't want the villagers to be alarmed by the fact that it's a magic ship. Felicia informs Enos that they didn't want to alarm the villagers at the sight of a magic ship, so she asks her to be careful around the villagers for a long time. This hurts Enos, as she realizes they wouldn't be able to microwave food, drink chilled drinks from the fridge, or even get a chance to use the shower. But Felicia reassures her that it's only for a few days. Later, the village chief hands over 20 villagers into Wataru's care. After the first five days of their trip, Wataru remarks about how clustered the ship is, but he admits that it's only natural since there were 20 people. He also tries to reassure himself that it was only for a short while. After all, they had just two more days before they reached their final destination. Just then, one of the villagers walks up to Wataru. It turns out Romano's dad reveals that he had already tied up his son and would make sure he was of no trouble. He thanks Wataru for his help before walking off. Wataru announces that they will set sail soon and heads for the deck, where Romano is seen tied up by a corner. Enos remarks on how the boat moves with magic and comments that it must be painfully hard for Wataru to pretend he is steering the ship. Just then, Wataru realizes that Romano has escaped, and he's assured that only bad things can happen from here on out. 
His thoughts are proven when he hears Romano asking his father not to be brainwashed by Wataru. He also begs Felicia to return home since she has been freed from her captivity. His father begs him to stop his foolishness, but Romano asks Wataru to stop the ship. Romano heads over to the deck, where he spies a sleeping sea serpent. He mutters about having to do something if the worst gets to the worst, and the sleeping beast suddenly wakes up. It stretches out in front of the ship, and the villagers are scared, but Wataru asks them to flee to the ship's safety. The serpent strikes at the ship, but Romano's father is surprised when nothing happens, and the ship retreats. He suddenly realizes that the serpent is being repelled by the ship, and Wataru admits that the ship can repel all forms of monsters. Romano's father thanks Wataru for the hundredth time that day before declaring him their hero. They eventually arrive at their destination, and Wataru tells Ines that everyone seems to like it there. He calls out to Romano, who answers him rudely, but Wataru outright asks if he likes Felicia. Romano later admits that this is the reason for his deep hatred for Wataru, but Wataru advises him to confess his feelings. He reveals that he would be happy for Romano if Felicia returned his feelings, but he would cease to be a villain if he didn't. Ines cringes at this as it makes Wataru sound like an alpha male, but Romano happily agrees. After Romano leaves, Ines asks why he sounds so confident, but she realizes that Wataru is already confident that Felicia will never agree to date Romano. Later, Romano approaches Wataru and thanks him before revealing that Felicia had turned him down. After the villagers build the new city, Wataru returns to the other villagers. They arrive at the new location for the Dark Elf Village within six days, making the relocation a success. After Wataru's return, he's stunned at how the Dark Elf Village had changed in just a few days and how the villagers had already started constructing buildings. He informs the village chief that he has brought the vegetable seeds and the carts he was asked to bring. He also asks if he can help out with anything else, but the chief assures him that he had helped them as best as he could, but he could leave the rebuilding to the villagers for the time being. After the village chief leaves, Wataru confides in Felicia about how he would love to go pepper trading, but if he goes on a voyage, it might take him months before he returns. Felicia informs him that she would also love to stay in the village, but as her father had said, they would have to leave the villagers to rebuild for the primary time. Wataru decides to go pepper trading with the girls, and Felicia appears to be super excited about this. Luckily for them, a civil war hasn't broken out in the south, and they're able to stack up pepper worth 65 platinum coins. They also arrive in Tevoli within 10 days using the ship's fast autopilot features. Later, Wataru discusses with Ines and Felicia how he had done a few calculations, and it seems he might have gotten a little greedy with the pepper this time. He informs them that the luxury liner costs 500 platinum coins, but right now, they have 515 rubber boats worth of pepper, leading Felicia to suggest that they buy it. Wataru informs her that they can easily afford it since he also had 1894 platinum coins if they included his savings. Ines and Wataru are so excited that they start dancing about as they think of the luxurious life they could live alongside, all the delicious food they could eat. Still, Felicia chooses to be the party pooper by informing them that they could only eat those foods if they sold all their pepper. Wataru's daydreams come to a sad end when he realizes that they can only sell 20 rubber boats worth of pepper without attracting the Commerce Guild's attention. Anything more than that would make them targeted by the other merchants, who would realize that Wataru has diverse means of getting to the southern continent. But the worst part is that he would have to make 26 roundhouse trips before selling their entire stores. Wataru suddenly gets an idea to get more cruisers and magic fleets. But Felicia warns him that the nobles and the country would probably not stay silent if they learned that he had more than one magic ship of that size. Wataru is depressed about having all the goods he needs to afford a luxury liner, but he can't find a way to sell them. Just then, Ines comes up with an idea to help Wataru sell all his goods. She reveals that he can sell it in other places aside from the southern continent, and Wataru calls her a genius. Felicia feels a sharp pang of jealousy because she had not thought of that idea herself, but her thoughts are cut short by Wataru, who announces their return to the southern continent. They arrive at the Commerce Guild, and Camille is delighted to see them. She remarks on the incredible quality of Wataru's pepper and offers him 72 platinum coins. Wataru thanks her and asks if he can get 30 platinum coins in cash, leading Camille to assume that he is planning to trade in other places. She has an angry outburst, but Wataru lies to her about his true intentions and reveals that he was only planning to use the money to fund a trip. Camille suggests a religious state in the East, 
and Wataru wonders if it'll be safe for them since it's a religious place. He asks if it's a peaceful country, and Camille asks if he's planning to visit other places, but Wataru takes his leave before she develops any more ideas. On his way out with Inez and Felicia, he informs them that he plans to visit the members of the Girasol, who happen to be their old friends while giving them souvenirs. The ladies are delighted at the souvenirs, and some of them even flirt with him while suggesting that he pick out something for them. Claretta, one of Wataru's friends, is stunned after realizing that Wataru is heading toward Palermo because she has always wanted to go there. But unfortunately, the surrounding villages were filled with human extremists who hate half-human creatures like them. Wataru recalls that it was for this same reason that Felicia's village had to relocate. Claretta suggests that they follow Wataru since he would be traveling by sea and would have fewer chances of running into humans, but Inez reminds them that they might be stopped for an inspection and that it would be harder to hide a large number of elves. Later, Wataru sulks about how it would have been easier to escape attention if he had traveled with all the girls. He was suddenly notified that he could purchase a new ship with a jacuzzi and six bedrooms. Wataru daydreams about how he could finally enjoy time with the girls and instantly plans to purchase the new ship. Wataru realizes that if he is going to invite the girls on a trip, he would have to be a charming host, so he considers the food items to buy. He also daydreams about having a fun time with the girls while they strut around in bikinis, so he decides to ask Enos and Felicia if they know of any places where they could get swimsuits. The girls reveal that they have no idea what a swimsuit is, and Wataru is pained to learn that there are no swimsuits in this world, since sea beasts frolicked in the winter and swimming would be a dumb way to pass the time. But Wataru is so consumed by thoughts of the girls in swimsuits that he decides to find a local tailor to do the job. Wataru calls an old man to build the beach huts for 61 silver coins before visiting a tailor, whom he asks to help him design the girls' swimsuits. He tells her that they should have a smooth, silky texture, and Alessia reveals that she has something similar. Wataru asks her to sew the same style for the girls, although he's a bit disappointed that it's not overly revealing. Later on, the girls arrive at Wataru's boat, and he decides to tell them the truth about his powers since it would be too tasking to keep pretending for a long while. Wataru uses his magical powers to summon a boat, and the ladies are impressed by this. One of the girls remarks on how Wataru isn't just a lucky boy like they thought he was, but he actually has magical powers. He also informs them that he has also summoned their current boat. Unfortunately, Wataru has to steer the boat himself because he has never been to Palermo before, so the boat can't follow his mind map. Wataru is a bit pained that he won't be joining in all the fun, but he looks forward to a very eventful night. Later that night, Wataru walks up to the girls and asks them if they have been enjoying the ride. Ha! Please, of course they did. He also asks if they have gotten familiar with it, and Claretta reveals that Inez and Felicia have told them a lot about it. They also ask him about his other ships, and Wataru reveals his hidden card. He had prepared a special ship for the night. Wataru summons a ship, leaving everyone speechless for a while. The ship is the literal embodiment of a ship from a sci-fi movie. It had trees growing alongside an island, a jacuzzi, and all the other features that Wataru had imagined. Suddenly, Ines yanks Wataru and asks him what the name of this creation is, and Wataru contemplates the name before deciding to call it the SS Hideaway. With pride, he asks the others to join him in exploring the ship. After they mount on the SS Hideaway, Wataru wonders how he would manage to grab the ladies' attention. He decides to do so by playing the role of a host and asking them to look around the ship. Wataru reveals that the SS Hideaway is literally an island, so they couldn't go on a cruise with it, but it would be the perfect ship to spend the night on. He also disguises the ship, although the disguise does little to hide its magnificence. Meanwhile, one of the ladies remarks that Wataru had also used this tactic for Klugo, which would explain the difference between the interior and exterior of Klugo. Wataru suggests that they check out the ship, and one of the ladies marvels that this ship has bedrooms. Wataru is also surprised because while he had expected that the SS hideaway would be magnificent, he didn't think it would be this beautiful. He's also surprised at how it looks more like a vacation home, even though he had seen it in pictures. One of the ladies remarks that there are only four bedrooms and suggests they share one. Still, instead of grabbing the opportunity, Wataru reveals that there are six rooms on this ship and that he, Felicia, and Ines could share two while the other girls could share the rest. Alessia reveals her desire to guard and thank him for his kindness, but Wataru insists against it. The other girls come around and Wataru suggests he guide her.
Inez chooses this moment to tell Wataru in a not-so-subtle way that shows his real intentions. Wataru asks the girls if they have seen anything that caught their fancy, and one of them reveals that she has been fascinated by a bath-like fixture on the second floor. They check it out, and Wataru enjoys showering with the girls. Wataru realizes he's staring at the girls too much, so he decides to grab them drinks before he comes off as a weirdo. While grabbing drinks, Wataru reflects on his relationship with the girls. He chats a lot with Alessia, who happens to be the leader of Girasoli, but he doesn't think she sees him as a man. Irma always caught him staring at her and insinuating things with her, but he realized that she was only teasing him. On the other hand, he had cooked a lot with Claretta, but they had never really discussed anything else. What were they? Housewives? It was a thorny road to romance. Just then, Dorothea and Marina walk up to Wataru and ask if they can sleep together. He instantly gets his hopes up, but he suddenly realizes that they were asking if they could sleep with Rimu and agrees to this. A few moments later, Wataru returns to the deck, where he resumes sailing. He appears to be grumbly since he can't have fun with any of the girls and cannot engage in any of the activities. Inez, Felicia, and Alessia notice this, so they offer to help him out with the steering. Wataru realizes that he could actually teach them and get back to doing fun stuff, so he takes them on a steering class. Wataru later returns to the other girls and joins them in playing cards. He also makes snacks for them and manages to grab the attention of Kara. Wataru notices Kara's interest in him, but he decides to go with the flow, even though she isn't his initial choice. Later on, Wataru notices some mermen swimming near the ship, but he informs the girls that while they aren't strong, they could be troublesome to deal with. They often attack with the rest of their pack. Rimu defeats one of the monsters, and Wataru thanks Alessia for their help. They eventually arrive at the port of Berleta, but they're surrounded by people who gawk at them. They're stunned at the beauty of the members of Girasole. Wataru decides to hide his appearance to avoid becoming an object of envy, so he gets down to business pretty quickly. He asks around for where to get food supplies, and he's directed to the Commerce Guild. On the way to the Commerce Guild, the girls still capture much attention due to their striking beauty. After they arrive at the Guild, an elderly man asks the ladies about their business, and Wataru reveals that he's the one in charge. His vibrant aura suddenly becomes dull, and Wataru quickly goes down to business and reveals his plans to sell pepper. The old man tells him that he's stunned at the impeccable quality of the pepper because it tastes like it's from the southern continent. The man is so impressed by the quality of the spice that she asks Wataru to name his price. Wataru is stunned by this as he's not so good with negotiations. He recalls that they had sold the spice for three platinum coins during their last sale and plans to sell it if the man bargains for a higher price. Wataru is thrilled and instantly sells the pepper as the man reveals that he will buy each rubber boat for four platinum and fifty gold coins. Afterward, the girls congratulate Wataru for his impeccable negotiation skills. They also discuss how they couldn't wait to see the religious state and its shrine, because they had heard rumors of how the god of creation had specially carved out idols and bestowed divine powers on those within the cathedral. Wataru has a bad feeling about this but arranges for a carriage. A few days later, Marina announces that the capital city is almost coming into view, while the other girls praise Wataru for giving them rubber rafts, which have helped make the carriage seats more comfortable. After they lay foot in Barletta, the capital city of Palermo, the girls wander around for a bit, but Alessia calls Claretta's attention to the fact that they first had to return the carriage. Later, they enter the main province, where they see the idols that Alessia claimed had been bestowed by the god of creation. Wataru contemplates asking about the female statues, but he says nothing. He decides to thank the god of creation for his ship-summoning abilities, but he's surprised when he's teleported to a new realm and faces a beautiful person or goddess. Since he's not entirely sure of her identity, he decides to thank the god of creation for his ship-summoning abilities. He soon discovers that she's the beautiful goddess of light, but his excitement is short-lived as she reveals that the girls will get into trouble and he has to save them with his boat summoning abilities. Wataru asks if he could stop them from doing whatever troublesome thing they planned on doing, but the goddess of light informs him that it's not something he could change. Just then, Wataru returns to the real world, where he sees the girls talking about their trip to the chapel. Wataru considers disguising himself as a fortune teller and asking the girls not to do anything troublesome, but he realizes that he couldn't warn them because he wasn't aware of what to warn them about so he asks them what they want to do next. Claretta wanted to stay in the chapel for a bit longer, while Marina and Dorothy revealed that they had acquired a new skill called the Tame Skill, 
However, Wataru wonders if the tame skill is related to the troublesome thing that the goddess had warned him about. Dorothea informs him that they would love to get slime as well and asks if they could go slime searching after he has concluded his business. Wataru is forced to agree to this since he would look like a bad host if he had not. After they arrive in front of a scary looking cave, the girls announce that they have reached Hellwind Cave. Dorothea screams in excitement as she urges the group to go slime hunting in Hellwind Cave. On their way in, Dorothea informs Wataru that some parts of the cave are blocked off by flooding, so they might need his help summoning a boat. Wataru regrets his decision to follow the girls, although he admits that he only gave in because of their doe-eyed expressions. Dorothea enthusiastically cheers them on while saying who knew what they might find. They eventually arrive at one of the flooded places that Dorothea had been speaking of, so he summons a boat to sail them across. Marina realizes that they have yet to see a normal-looking slime and wonders if their trip to this cave had not been a mistake. Wataru recalls that he had seen slimes in forests, but couldn't recall seeing any in caves. Marina reveals that she wanted a wind slime that could use wind magic with her. Just then, a strong breeze blows past them, and they run after it as they realize that the dream slime that Marina had always wanted was right out of them. The slime swims away and they chase after it, but they lose a sign of it in their ship. After they find dry land, they step away and are in awe of the beauty of their surroundings. Wataru notices the girls walking off and asks them not to wander too far. Marina also believes that they're the first people to explore this part of the cave. Not too long afterward, Iruma calls everyone's attention to a dragon. They're stunned by its size and the fact that it's a rare beast. Dorothea gives Wataru a brief history of dragon. She reveals that there are dragons and mythical dragons, but both are different. She also informs him that this dragon looks more like a mythical dragon and tells him that it possesses light, darkness, earth, fire, or water, but only one of these elements would exist in a dragon. She also reveals that they were lucky to encounter one, but Wataru is more concerned about the others saying nothing about the slime. Aleska reveals that the dragon has nine scales, one tooth, and three claws. Wataru wonders how much the dragon would fetch in the market, but Ines points out that capturing a dragon is tough. Iruma further reveals that she had also found some medicinal plants, which she draws their attention to. She decides to ask the country to promote the medicinal plants and the cave. Wataru realizes that if he allows them to continue their search for much longer, they might find another use for the dragon's scale or, worse, some more medicinal plants. Marina reveals that carrying the dragon with them would be a suicide mission, and they would probably get into trouble with the guild if they showed them some of the medicinal plants they had gathered while keeping others. Iruma suggests that they present the cathedral with two dragon scales and some medicinal plants while they keep the rest. Just then, a strong breeze blows past them, and they find the slime from earlier. Marina cautiously approaches the slime and asks if it would love to go on adventures with her, to which it tells her yes.